Father, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for new life in Christ, for the fellowship of the saints that we share as your blood-bought adopted children. Lord, thank you that we are able to uh, meet people from very different places than we are and know that bond that comes in Christ through the Holy Spirit that transcends uh, differences immediately. Lord, thank you for your word that guides us now in the spirit who is at work. The one who inspired it now illumines our minds and we pray he would be evidently at work as we think more this afternoon about who Jesus is. Would you please help us to deepen this understanding, not only of Christ, but of ourselves in light of who he is. Thank you for our guests. Please bless their time here, regardless of where they end up going to school, Lord. Make it a time where they're encouraged uh, to love you more in light of how much you love them. Lord, thank you for this time. We commit these few precious minutes to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, page 92 is where we left off last time, talking about the humanity of Christ. The four essential affirmations of biblical Christology are, just found it there, number one, what is it? Jesus is fully and completely divine. Good. Two? Yes, you are brilliant. You're like British school children. Just right on top of it. Three? That's four. Shawnee? What are? Complete sentences, my friend. What are distinct? Good. Good. Oh, Shawnee, don't hesitate, woman. That's good. Yes. His divine and human natures are distinct, but... <laughs> oh, yes. What? What's the fourth? These complete sentences, people. What are? That's not a complete sentence. All right, uh, everyone. Megan, from, from New Hampshire. Yes. Fully and completely unified. What are? His two natures His are fully. Two natures are completely un unified. How? In one, person. In one person. Good. All these words are important. His natures are completely <laughs> united in one poison. Good. So, we have been talking about the humanity of Christ. We established the deity of Christ from the scriptures, and now we're right in the middle of talking about the humanity of Christ. We concluded last time with this amazing teaching that Jesus had a human religious life. We saw that one of the ways he's human is that he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. So we see now that to be human does not necessarily mean to be sinful. Now that's all we get in this version that we're in, in this fallen world. But that doesn't mean that that's what humanity necessarily is. And so in Christ we continue to find out that humans are not necessarily sinful. We have the capability to be truly human and not sinful. Now it's important to realize that We've been arguing our whole lives for depravity, haven't we? Because most people in our culture say, oh, people are all basically good. But the Bible teaches us that's not true. Humans are sinful. But what can happen is we can start to think, therefore, the problem is humanity. The problem isn't with humanity. It's with sin that has invaded humanity. And so we, we study Jesus and we're starting to see something very important about ourselves, that you are not then called to be superhuman. You're not called to transcend your humanity. You're called to be redeemed humanity, restored humanity, sanctified humanity, and Jesus leads the way in this. And so Jesus overcomes temptation in his humanity in all ways tempted like us, and clearly without sin as we saw last time. So how does he do this? He does it the same way we do. We have this, 
this instinct to assume the reason Jesus was sinless is because he was always depending on his divine nature to be that way. If that's the case, he doesn't really represent you or me in his sinlessness. He doesn't obey in my place if he's constantly depending on his divine nature. So how does he do it? He does it with the word. He does it by being a man of the word. He does it with a life of prayer and a life of fellowship and a life of devotion to God. He had a human religious life, as we saw last time. He overcomes temptation in his humanity by doing things like praying and becoming a man who's saturated with the scriptures, where when he's confronted with temptation by Satan himself, he does what? He does not say, I won't turn stones to bread, I'll turn you to bread. Poof. He doesn't do that, does he? <laughs> he doesn't say, get out of here, I'll turn you in a lump of clay. You can turn Satan into a lump of clay. Or, get off this mountain, I'll blast you with my transfiguration glory. Pow, watch this. And he falls off the mountain. <laughs> this is how it happens. He doesn't fight with weapons of deity. He fights with weapons of humanity. And does what? What does he do over and over again in that scene? It is written. Satan, I'm going to quote right in your face these scriptures that I committed to memory as a little kid. At times it was hard for me to memorize those because I'm human, but I did it. And now they've become weapons of warfare in overcoming even satanic attack. Now, you immediately say, well, Jesus really had to study, memorize scripture? He wrote it after all. Yes, he did. In his humanity, he devoted himself to the scriptures and he became someone who learned and developed and grew over time. Don't overly impose his deity on his humanity where he's not really human anymore and there's not truly a human process anymore. So, Jesus is fully and completely human and had a human religious life. So please, have a wonderful place in your life to be religious. <coughs> it seems like every other person I hear preaching to you these days is telling you to only emphasize internal realities and not external actions. I mean, how many times have you heard, it's not about what you do, it's who you are? <laughs> okay. All right, that's true to some degree, isn't it? That, that God cares about the state of your heart and he cares about who you are internally, not just what you do externally. And God hates empty religion. He hates mere external practice. He really hates that. But don't you think it might be an oversimplification to say it's not about what you do, it's who you are, as if who you are isn't in some way displayed by what you do. And as if what you do doesn't in some way form who you are. So let's not be overly simplistic and create some false dichotomy between who you are and what you do. If it's just who you are and not what you do, Jesus wouldn't have gotten up very early in the morning to go and pray when it was cold and dark and lonely. He did that because he knew those were the resources of a life of holiness. So be religious, that's what I'm saying. I, I know the phrase is Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. It's a relationship maintained by religious practice. Let's not be so overly spiritualized in our understanding of spirituality that it doesn't include going to church when believers around the world are gathering. Uh, there's a wonderful, important place for flat-out discipline in the Christian life. Yes, we need to hate empty religion, but then not swing on the pendulum to the point where we don't realize the reality of relationship. You know, if I, my wife came to me and said, Eric, we haven't been on a date for three months. And I said, oh, come on, honey, it's not about what we do, it's about relationship. That ain't gonna fly. We haven't had a good conversation in a while. Ah, oh, it's not about, honey, we're not human doings, we're human beings. <laughs> Let's just be together. <laughs> she ain't buying it, right? She's not gonna go there because she knows all good relationships are maintained by good practice, by actually doing things. <laughs> And so please, don't have an overly mystical, overly, overly spiritual view of spirituality. I mean, that's what everybody wants to say in our culture today, right? 
I'm spiritual, but not religious. Which means I do whatever I want, whenever I want, and I call it spiritual. I don't submit to anything outside of myself. Um, you know how often the Bible says things like, listen, hear, pay attention. In other words, shut up and pay attention and listen to what's coming from outside of you. Um, we need to have a wonderful place in our life for, for submitting. You know, my, when a woman comes to my wife and says, Donna, I think I've met the one, I, I've met the man that I think I'm going to marry. What do, you, what do you think? And she always says the same thing. Does he submit to the authorities in his life? That's her first question, not is he cute, but does he submit to the authority in his life? And usually the woman says, what does that mean? She's not even sure. And my wife says, well, it means there are, there are older men in his life, uh, ideally part of his local church, ideally part of the leadership of that local church that he actually submits to. Is that a reality? And she said, I don't know, I'll ask him. So she goes and asks, and I remember she asked a woman that one time, and so she, she went to her boyfriend, and he didn't know what, what my wife meant either, so he emailed me asking me what, what, uh, what I meant by that. And I said, yeah, there are, there are older men in your life, part of the leadership of your church that you submit to. In other words, that when you're married, if you're not loving your wife the way you should, they'll come and visit. They'll knock on your door and call you out. Do you have those uh, kinds of men in your life? And, and here's what he said. He said, the Lord hasn't blessed me with that yet. The Lord hasn't blessed me with that yet. As if we wait around to obey God until he blesses us with those circumstances. As if we don't actually make those things happen by going up to an elder in our church and introducing ourselves and saying, can we have lunch this week? I'd like to submit to your leadership in my life. <laughs> my wife says, if he doesn't have that, run away quickly. See, that's religious, though. That that's, feels so oh, real. We don't quite like it. And so, so I want us to be religious people in, in the best possible way. I fear we've swung in the never-ending pendulum swings of the church away from legalism and external religiosity to vague, mystical, fuzzy spirituality that we can never really define. So we can't say... You know what? I think I'm growing in Christ. I think I'm like Jesus in that I have a prayer life like he did. I, 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 I'm devoting myself to the scriptures. I'm, I'm the kind of person that if you wonder where I am on a Sunday morning, you don't have to wonder very long. Just like Jesus who had this custom of going to the synagogue. We've got this idea of spontaneous, merely internal, mystical, uh, uh, fuzzy, vague, emotional definitions of true spirituality that are anything but Christian. They're far more Eastern. They're far more Buddhist than they are Christian. Okay. I, re I realize this can be misunderstood. Anybody want to ask a question or clarify something or anything? Taylor? Uh, what are your... Yeah, uh, there, there's definitely a place for... Uh, the sort of introspective, meditative, uh, solitude-oriented sorts of religious practices. But as soon as you start saying things like empty your mind, that's not Christian at all. That, that's not even possible. Um, so that's not how we're made. What is the constant command in scriptures? Fill your mind with the truth that actually comes consistently external from you. The constant command is look inside yourself, look inside yourself. You need to do that. But what that should do is make you look outside of yourself, right? Not go deeper in yourself. And it, it seems to be look inside yourself, even in Christian spirituality these days, is said 10 times and look to Jesus in the scriptures is said once. I would just like to reverse that. I would just like to, yes, do some heart work. But, but make that flee, cause you to flee to the scriptures and to, the, to Christ. 
For every one look in ourselves, it's been said, we should take 10 looks at Jesus. And I think it's kind of the other way around. And, and to me, that's starting to feel uh, more Eastern than Christian. Okay, anything? I know this is a little bit disconcerting to some. Maybe not. Okay. What else? Well, this is, this is just amazing. Jesus is perceived by other people to be a man. So much so that he did nothing to prepare them for 30 years of living in Nazareth for his messianic authority based on how they were defining the Messiah. Look at Matthew 13. Coming to his hometown, Jesus began teaching people in their synagogue. Now, has anybody ever been to Nazareth? It's a puny little town. It's amazing to me. That's one thing that shocked me the whole time I was in, in Israel, is how small things were. I realized they had taken on mythical proportions for me. Um, when they were so real. And here's Jesus in this relatively small town compared with modern ideas of big and small. And he starts teaching in the synagogue. And the people are amazed and they say, where does this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they ask. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get these things? And look, and they took offense at him. They didn't say, well, I knew that old Jesus was going to grow up. I, I voted him most likely to succeed after all. And he's always been pretty special, hasn't he? And that Jesus, uh, chip off the old block. No, it's what? The carpenter's kid? We watched him play in our streets. He had no sort of external flamboyant display of who he was that prepared them for his messiahship based on their definitions of messiahship. Now add to this, he was sinless. You'd think being sinless would get some attention. <laughs> right, you'd think they say, well, after all, he's never sinned, so it makes sense he's the messiah. No, they took offense at him. There must be something going on with God's definition of godliness and holiness and righteousness and sinlessness that's really different from ways we tend to define those things. Meg. Do you think that they were consciously aware, though, that he, that he did not sin? Or? No, it was probably something like this. Jesus, the Messiah? You know, I, I can't think of anything he's done sinful, but Messiah? It's probably like that. Uh, but... I mean, they had a clear sense of righteousness. They had things that were part of their definition of righteousness that isn't God's definition. But they at least weren't prepared by this man who never sinned. I wonder if we define godliness in ways that uh, are just dramatic to the point where we miss real godliness. You know, start listening to when people describe Christians as on fire Christians. They don't usually say things like, he kept his wedding vows for 50 years. He supported his family when his dad died so responsibly, which is most likely what Jesus did. They, they tend not to emphasize, you know, he was so consistently compassionate. We tend to emphasize things that put you on stages and make headlines. That kind of thing, it doesn't get attention. What kind of godliness are you striving for in your life? What kind of holiness are you striving for in your life? The kind that gets noticed? Because I, I look at a passage like this and I, I think, oh, true godliness probably doesn't get noticed most of the time. It probably gets missed. And what do we do? We got this rock star mentality in the church where somebody's really gifted in some ways and so we put them up front and assume godliness and then two years later they fail and we're so disappointed. When they didn't have the character that made them deserve to be up front. And I don't care how well they played their guitar. And so give me a musician who's far less talented and godly than one who's talented through the roof and isn't godly. 
Right? But, but we've got this celebrity mentality, this dramatic mentality. I just am staggered that Jesus' sinlessness didn't seem to get noticed. And, and maybe we should strive for one that doesn't either. Jess. Oh, because he loved to poke at the traditions of men that got added to the law. So he was poking at the traditions of yes. the law. Yes, yeah. All these rabbinic interpretations of Sabbath keeping, for instance. Okay. He would love to say, oh, you're missing the whole point. Okay. Yeah. Good, right. Um, Did, yeah, yeah. Like some that they, oh, I didn't realize I committed. So yeah, you know, it's interesting. His mom and dad take him to the temple when he's a baby to offer uh, what you do for a baby at that time. So I, I'm not sure the Bible doesn't unpack that for us, but that is an interesting question, especially with the legitimate progression in his understanding throughout his life, in his human nature. That's a great question. The Bible doesn't ever give us an instance of that, but that's a great question. It could be one of the ones you ask one day. Good. When, when the one who can answer it's there. Yeah. So some people I've heard, um, they argue it's fought the law. Yeah. Yeah, internally and externally. It's that internal reality that's really amazing and often, I'm sure, got missed by most people. That there was a, a heart attitude, an, an absence of coveting that nobody notices. Right? Uh, when you decide not to gossip, Miles, nobody knows that but God. Right? Nobody in you. And, and so that's what I mean about noticing or not noticing godliness. Um, so much of godliness never gets noticed by anybody but you and the Lord. Y yet we can be pharisaical in our efforts at godliness that ends up being anything but godliness. Good. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Jesus was perceived by others to be a man and scripture calls Jesus a man. Over and over again, Jesus calls himself a man, affirming his humanity. Tempted by Satan, he says, Man shall not live on bread alone, Satan. And being a man, I don't either. See the point? But on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And as we've said before when we talked about the ascension, Jesus' humanity remains forever. He doesn't give it up. It's not a booster rocket on the space shuttle that comes off as he's ascending, going into heaven. It's a permanent uniting. It's a permanent reality, and this is great news and astoundingly wonderful news, and we've talked about this before. But look at these not only post-resurrection, but post-ascension pictures of Jesus. Remember the angel says to them after the ascension, the same Jesus is coming back in the same way as you've watched him go? And then Paul refers back to his meeting with Jesus on the road to Damascus, right? Jesus is on his way, to, uh, Paul's on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. There didn't quite seem to be enough to kill in Jerusalem. So he's heading for Damascus. And who meets him and knocks him on his back on the road to Damascus but Jesus? He has a meeting with Jesus. And actually, Paul uses that as a basis for his true apostleship. What's one of the prerequisites of true apostleship? Yes, Jesus has to appear to you. You have to have had a, a, a meeting with Jesus. Paul never did until after the ascension. And that's why he refers to his apostleship as legitimate but different, doesn't he? Uh, look what he says in 1 Cor 9.1. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Oh, and look what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. And last of all, as to one untimely born. In other words, my meeting with Jesus, my appearance of Jesus came post-ascension. Unlike the other apostles, I had to wait to a different time than they to meet the Lord. Revelation 1. Look at this post-ascension, actually end time picture of Jesus. In the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a what? Son of man, a human. And as glorious as he is in this state, he still maintains his likeness to the Son of Man, a Son of Man, a human clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, but, but human nonetheless. And listen to Hebrews 7. Therefore, in light of what Jesus has done as the great high priest, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, 
since he lives to make intercession for them. Next week we'll talk about the priestly office of Christ, but, but part of that is this ongoing intercession he does for us. He intercedes for us. He stands as the intercessor between us and God because he really still represents us before God as one of us. That's what Paul's getting at in 1 Timothy 2. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, he says present tense, post-ascension as he writes this, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus' humanity is permanently now united to deity in Christ. And he lives forever as the risen, incarnate God-man. This is great news. It will indeed be a human hand that flings open the gates of heaven for you. It needs to be. So, so what? What does all this mean? What does all this add up to? If we don't have a truly human Christ, what do we lose? Everything. Everything. It's staggering what we lose. Point A in your notes. When we look at Jesus, we see the nature of true humanity. We see the nature of true humanity. We not only learn about God, we not only learn about the Son of God, we learn about ourselves when we look at Jesus. We see that the problem with humanity is not humanity per se, it's the sinfulness of it. We see in Jesus what we were intended to be and what we will be in Christ. We will be free from sin. And it won't mean you transcended your humanity. It will mean your humanity's been redeemed. It's become what it was intended to be. We find out who we are when we look at Jesus. We spend way too much time looking at each other when we want to find out who we are, or just ourselves. That's why I say, look at Jesus way more than you just gaze at your navel. Look at Jesus. He shows you who you're intended to be and who you will be one day. What else happens? When we see the humanity of Christ, we recognize this radical affirmation of humanity. That when God becomes a man and permanently unites humanity to deity, we get this radical affirmation of the goodness of humanity, don't we? Now don't forget, it's God becoming human which is made in his image, more like him than anything else he's made. And so he is radically affirming humanity in all its dimensions, not just the spiritual aspect of humanity, but physical as well. As even after his resurrection, he eats broiled fish. Guys, this should transform your view of everything in the created order. When you see God becoming a man and bringing this sanctifying aspect to humanity, including the physical realm, it should transform the way you see everything, including a good cup of coffee. <clears throat> taste buds. God had taste buds and enjoyed a good meal. And he enjoyed naps. Oh, I love naps. <laughs> I'm actually a pretty exceptional napper. I have perfected napping. Maybe not perfected. There's still room to grow always, but I'm close. I'm close. You know, many of the greatest leaders of all time were good nappers. Did you know that? <coughs> yes, it's true. The, 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 the former pope was a serious napper. Churchill may have been the best napper in the past 200 years. <laughs> Actually, serious nappers refer to a nap. You know the kind of nap where you say, I'm not going to flirt with a nap. I'm taking a nap. And you put on the PJs, shut the blinds, get under the covers kind of nap, right? Churchill took one of those every day. But didn't he also have he didn't sleep much at night, yes. But this was, this, was part of, <laughs> this was part of his survival. Come on, Megan. I'm on a roll here. Yes. Actually, serious nappers refer to that kind of nap as a Churchillian nap. So if you ever say, how you doing? And I say, great, I just had a Churchillian nap. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Um, 
I have no idea. Oh, it does matter. Jesus took naps. I'm sure of it. Uh, all of these aspects of life has the, have this sanctifying reality when you think God did them. Uh, there, there's a reality to, to reality that is wonderful when, we, when you see it this way. Okay, uh, look, Jesus uh, sanctifies everything, including the material world. Remember, it, we, God created everything. He called it very good. And li listen to what Paul says to Timothy. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. So what does that mean about the things of this world then? Like riches. Who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Everything to enjoy. There's this view of everything now that is for God's glory and our enjoyment. There's this idea of the Christian life that Christians are those people who aren't allowed to enjoy anything. And that's most certainly true of sin. You know, the main difference between being a Christian and not being a Christian regarding sin is not that Christians don't sin anymore. It's just that they can't enjoy it like they used to. And so it's certainly true that we don't get to enjoy sin like unbelievers, but it's certainly not true that we don't get to enjoy life and everything in it because we realize God made it all, declared it very good, and then provides it for us to enjoy. That means music and art and relationships and, and naps and everything is given to us for us to enjoy. We should have such a positive view of the world. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of the philosopher. I think it was, I think it was Nietzsche who said, the reason I'm not a Christian is because I never saw the members of my father's church enjoying themselves. Huh. Uh, there's something about Christians where we should deeply enjoy life, drink of life, and, and dive into it. Uh, okay. Uh, what else is true if Jesus is human? Well, he really represents us in his obedience. The incarnation is necessary, point C, for Jesus' representative of, of obedience for us. Look at Romans 5. Consequently, because Jesus is the new Adam, this new representation of our humanity, consequently, just as the result of one trespass, Adam's disobedience, was condemnation for all men. We all went down together. So also the result of one act of righteousness, Jesus' life, probably most specifically his obedience in going to the cross, this was justification that brings life to all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Do you see how important it is that Jesus really is one of us? He's really human. He really does represent us in his perfect life of obedience. That means when you read the Bible and read through the Gospels and see Jesus tell the truth every time, you can say, because I'm in Christ, I did that. When you see him show compassion and love and purity and gratitude, submissiveness to the will of the Father, you can say, I did that because I'm in Christ. Because his representative obedience really does represent me. This is wonderful news that you're not just forgiven, you're declared righteous in the sight of God. He doesn't just look at you with a clean slate, he looks at you with the righteousness of Christ. That's not just good enough. That's not 51% righteous or good enough or that'll just get you into heaven. That, that's as much as you'll ever need. The righteousness of Christ, and yet we battle all the time, don't we? Our standing before God, we wonder if he really will admit us into his presence sometimes. And he'll ha Satan will haunt us with sin in our past and failures and backslidings and, and mishaps we've had. 
And as Spurgeon encourages us to do, look Satan right in the eye and say, I know about all that. But Christ Jesus came to save sinners, and although my sin be great, he is quite able to put it all away. And he dies in your place, and he lives in your place. This gets missed a lot. He lived for you. He didn't just die for you. Why didn't he die in the, in the manger for your sins? You ever wonder that? Would have been more efficient in some ways, wouldn't it? Why didn't he die for your sins in the manger? Because he lived a full lifespan of righteousness in your place for you in your place. There we go. Throw this. I'm, do it for him, John. Save, save him. Okay. Good. All right. Um, frailty. Yes. Um, what else? Jesus represents us. He also truly represents us on the cross. It's not just in his life he represents us. It's as he hangs on a cross and dies for us. Listen to Hebrews 2.17. This is astounding. For this reason, the, the priesthood of Jesus uh, fulfilling what it's supposed to. For this reason, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every way. In every way. Why? Look at the causal connection. In order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Could it be any more clear? Could it be any more clear than that? That Jesus had to be made like us in every way. Why? So that he then could be that merciful and faithful high priest and give us access to God. Atonement doesn't happen if Jesus isn't really one of us. It's not enough for him to be God. He must be man. Atonement happens because Jesus is made like us in every way. What else? Jesus' incarnation was necessary for him to be a mediator between God and man. So you see representative obedience, you see substitute sacrifice reality because Jesus is human, and you see mediation. He's the one who stands between us and God. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He really does stand between God and man because he really is God and man. And Jesus' incarnation was necessary for him to be our example and pattern and model in life. Uh, there is this inclination we have, guys, when we see Jesus, we start to see him as an example, a pattern that we are then about to follow, and then we'll say something like in our minds, well, but he was God, of course he was that way. And he's no longer truly an example. Well, the Bible holds him up as our example. 1 John 2, 6. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. 1 Peter 2. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Leaving you an example. And if he's just the way he is because his divine nature keeps kicking in, well, how is that an example for us? That's not what we've got. We've got a true human being and therefore a true example, a pattern in our lives that we follow. What else? Jesus' incarnation is necessary for him to be our sympathetic high priest. This is precious truth right here. Listen to Hebrews 2.18. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted. Look, causal again. Because he suffered when he was tempted, Implication, if this didn't happen, the next thing didn't either, right? Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. A sympathy comes, a relational quality comes, a relational dynamic comes with the incarnation we didn't have otherwise. Hebrews 4. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin. So here comes the big causal implication. Let us then, in light of that, approach the throne of grace with confidence. Otherwise, you don't have any confidence, and it's not a throne of grace, it's a throne of wrath. But because Jesus really is one of us and has been tempted in every way and overcame it for us, then we have this confidence, we have this grace at that throne. And what else? So that we may receive mercy 
and find grace to help in our time of need. Every time you go to God, you go in Christ. You know, when you pray for help, you do that in Christ. And he's only able to be that for you if he really is representing you. This sympathetic high priest. So, we've got these powerful implications. You lose the humanity of Christ. You lose all of this. So important, we, we see the, the depth of importance of the humanity of Christ. We've spent our whole lives defending the deity of Christ. Right? Because that's what people say all the time. Jesus was a really God. But we've probably never had to defend the humanity of Christ in any conversations. And so what happens is it gets diminished constantly in our thinking and we actually don't lay this biblical basis out well enough so that when we come even to think about the how of the incarnation, we keep pushing humanity aside to preserve deity. And we can't do that or we lose, as you see, everything. Good, Jess. No, I haven't. Has anybody ever heard somebody saying the fact that Jesus didn't live to 50 minimizes in some way his legitimacy or fact? Has anybody ever heard that? I've never heard that. I think especially in a first century mindset, that, that's not an issue at all. Okay. What's that? Go ahead. It's dualist. I wouldn't want to say dyke. Uh, well, when we study oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I think you mean dualistic in that there's both material and immaterial. Yeah. We may be dichotomous in being just body and soul or trichotomous, but you mean, you mean body and soul. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, we kind of like, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So did Jesus experience spiritual growth then? Yeah. Yeah. When, when, when it says he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, I think that's this way of saying holistically he grew as a human. There wasn't an aspect of his human makeup that wasn't growing and developing. Yeah, I, again, it's not from sin to no sin, but it is an increased capacity to obey. So we expect a four-year-old to obey differently than we do a 14-year-old. It uh, doesn't mean the four-year-old's disobedient when he's not obeying like a 14-year-old. He's just obeying like a four-year-old. And, and so I do think that's true, not just uh, physically, but spiritually, psychologically, emotionally. I do think there was this maturation process in his human nature throughout his whole life. Yeah, Taylor. What do you think about uh, depicting Jesus in art? I've, om I've almost never seen a depiction of Jesus in art I really love. I don't know. I, j I just don't. But do you think it's right? Yeah, I think it's okay. I, I'm, I'm far more uncomfortable with depictions of God the Father uh, in art because uh, even, even Da Vinci in the Sistine Chapel, it's a really buff old dude, right? And I'm just... But the difference between Jesus then is God has given us an image of the invisible God in Christ that actually did have a human body and a visible appearance in, in, a, in a material way. So he was sense perceptible. So I think that does open the door artistically, but that's a bit of a diversion. All right, okay. Um, when we talk about the full, complete deity and humanity of Christ, the distinction of the natures and the unity of the natures in one person, We've already seen two ways you can get that wrong, right? We said that there was a heresy early on that denied the, the, the uh, deity of Christ. Do you remember, anybody remember what it was? No, not yet. It's one earlier and more radical than that. The Ebionites, the Ebionitism, this, this, this early Jewish sect, did Ferris teach you about this? Yeah, he mentioned it probably not well. Okay, if you look in your notes, uh, you'll see under the deity of Christ on page... Wow, oh, on page, where is it? 88, Ebionitism. See it? The most radical denial of the deity of Christ. This early Jewish sect literally means the poor ones because they had such a poor uh, appreciation for the deity of Christ. And they... Um, were this idea that Jesus was the Messiah, but God gave him messianic power, but that didn't come from any divine nature that he had. Uh, so the Ebionites, uh, uh, oh, right, here we go, uh, sorry. Uh, I need that too. Um, uh, the Ebionites, this is biblical Christology. 
Ebionitism is this first denial of the humanity of Christ by, by this early Jewish sect, the, the deity of Christ. They're the most radical denial. The second heresy related to deity we had was what? Arianism, good. And the Arians did what? Okay, good. So, so the Arians didn't deny the deity of Christ. They wanted to say he was divine in a similar way, but so they're not flat out denying it, but what they deny is what? What's our affirmation? Jesus Christ is fully and completely divine, and so what do they deny? They want to maintain deity, but what do they deny then about that affirmation? The fullness and completeness of that deity. So Arians are like modern-day Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons where they, they deny the full, complete deity of Christ. They both end you up in the same dilemma. But, but there's a progression here. Uh, the next heresy I want you to be aware of is uh, what we call docetism. Uh, the docetic heresy regarding Christ is based on an assumption about reality that comes from what we call Gnosticism. The Gnostic heresy is based on ideas that were starting to be really influential in, even in the first century. It's not a full formal way of thinking until after that, but uh, these ideas about reality, namely that there is a flesh spirit dichotomy. I know you've learned this, most of you, in the New Testament already, right? You learn about Gnosticism, this, this assumption that there's this radical duality between flesh and spirit. We learn that one of the main things the Bible teaches about humanity is that there's an intended unity of flesh and spirit. That the resurrection, for instance, the reuniting of flesh and spirit is this necessary, concluding, victorious part of Jesus' work in his life and ours. And so we don't believe in this radical dualism, but there was not only a dualism, there was a rejection of flesh as evil. So there was this assumption that flesh is evil, and that led to a couple different ways of living. One is, well, if, if flesh is evil, if the flesh doesn't matter, do whatever you want in the flesh and just grow spiritually. Which is actually, I hear that kind of talk among some sort of emergent Christian movements, you know, that, they, again, there's such an emphasis on spirituality that it doesn't really that matter that much what you do in your flesh, in the body. So, so there's a radical denial of flesh as evil, and so live however you want. Or it led to the other extreme of a radical asceticism, a denial of fleshly pleasures. And, and that actually is a stream we've seen in the church for centuries. This assumption of the fleshly world as being evil and the spiritual world as being good and it's this stinking body that's really keeping me down and if I could just transcend this body, get rid of this physical existence, everything would be great. There's this elevation of the spirit and so it's a rejection, a denial of the flesh. Now, if that's how you think, can you have a human Jesus? Can you have God becoming a man? No, you've got to, if you want to maintain some belief in Jesus, it's got to be a version. If this is what you're demanding is true, it's got to be a version that doesn't have a real human. And so, the Docetic heresy comes out of Gnostic thinking, and they had a version of Christ's humanity that was only the appearance of humanity. He was a phantasm. He was an appearance, an occurrence of humanity. And their favorite quotation was this. When Jesus walked on the beach... He left no footprints. So much for the little poem on your bathroom mirror. <laughs> the Gnostic, the, the Docetic version of that would be, in the hard times of your life, there were no footprints because I carried you and I don't leave them even when your weight is added to it. <laughs> something like that. It'd be something like that. And it would inspire you for the day. No, it wouldn't because Jesus is in one of you. He's, he's not really physical in that, that sense. And so the docetic heresy is, the, ah, no, is the denial of the, of the, the humanity of Christ. It, it can't handle, because of these presuppositions, a truly human Jesus, a true uniting of divine and human. Kitty. They, they literally believe that. 
Yes. Like Jesus is walking, there would be no. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a view. But you know, there are groups, Christian scientists don't believe in the physical realm. They believe everything's spirit, and everything that seems physical just seems physical. Which is why they often won't get medical care for their kid when they're sick, because to get medical care is to acknowledge that the sickness is real and the flesh that's having the sickness is real, so they want to be consistent with their faith, and the kid dies. And they get sued, and it gets in the papers. And we say, what do those people believe anyway? I thought all religions were basically the same. <laughs> Guess not. How then do you look at the crucifixion? Because obviously, as an appearance. So Jesus put on a facade of suffering and bleeding, and yes, there are even. How did he die? Uh, there are even versions where, uh, where people don't go full bore docetism, but they think that uh, when Jesus died, he vacated that human body beforehand. Uh, he. he yeah, I'm not saying it's easy to explain here, Bryce. I'm just telling you what they believe. I'm just the messenger. Um, yeah, so, so that's the descetic heresy. No, yeah, right. Does this, does this line of thought kind of come from passages like the, that, that Paul would bring up saying, you know, like how the flesh is, sure. you know, like weak and sinful? And sure, sure. So depending on how Paul's using sarks there, what he means by flesh is really important, isn't it? And yes, Christians have taken passages that use the term sarks for flesh to describe what? This, this aspect of our being that is inclined to carnality, to sin, that we still war against, rather than making a distinction between that and just mere flesh, being human, realizing that this is not the problem. It's the perversion of this. It's the distortion of this. That's the problem. It's the sinfulness of this. The solution is not to get rid of this. It's to redeem it. That's so important, guys, when we think about the Christian life. And the church has warred against Gnostic and ascetic tendencies its whole history. The church is filled with, with t even official teaching at time that makes you say, what's the view of the body here if Real priests need to be celibate. It's just one example. Um, what's your view of, of sex? You know, and the church has often done a really poor job of viewing and valuing the physical world. But a doctrine of Christ's humanity changes everything. It changes all of it. There's a sacredness now to humanity, including all its aspects, because of the Incarnation. You know, there's not only a lesson here in Christology, there's a lesson in theological method, isn't there? How we come to theological conclusions. Because what's their problem? They start with presuppositions and take them to the Bible. Arius did the same thing, right? He started with certain presuppositions and brought them here. And look, you can see some basis for this. You know, it seems like this is getting me in trouble all the time. It's hard for me to imagine God could take this on and eat. And so I just need to come up with a different formulation. I need to take these presuppositions to the Bible, but that's not what we do. This is a great lesson in theological method. We go to the scriptures and we don't conclude that uh, Jesus is not, because they say flesh is evil, therefore, uh, Jesus is not flesh, <laughs> right? That, that's what they've got to conclude. We don't do that. We go to the Bible, and as we've done for the last two days, we've said, oh, Jesus is flesh. Jesus is human in every way. And so our conclusion then is uh, Jesus is flesh. And we can actually come up with a different conclusion then. What's our conclusion? Oh, what is it? Yeah, flesh is an evil. Good. Yeah, F is not equal to E. <laughs> yes. Right. He just went to logic class. Um, yes, flesh is not evil. If Jesus is flesh, flesh is an evil. See, we come up with different conclusions because we're working hard to start with biblical presuppositions instead of bringing our Gnostic or pagan or uh, Oprah presuppositions to the Bible. <laughs> Not to lump them together. No, to lump them together. All right, Jordan, yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yes, they both can exist 
independently of one another, but that's a tragic result of the fall. That's what we're trying to get here, that this, what we call the intermediate state between death and resurrection is a tragic separating effect of human rebellion. Uh, humans can exist entirely independently of other humans on an island. That's not how they're intended to live. Oh, because it's, it's part of God's very good creation. It's what He's made, declared very good, and is in the process of redeeming, resurrecting, and glorifying. Um, it, it's what God desires, and the delights that come with that are intended by Him. And the restored state of humanity in that resurrected body, soul way is what He's after. And so our job is to rejoice in that, not not then say, well, if I can get by without a body in the intermediate state between death and resurrection, why not just stay there? That's settling for far less than what he declared very good in creation and brings about in resurrection and glorification. It, it's recognizing God intends this. And yes, it's possible for them to uh, exist independently. We've got a, a body without a soul, and we've got a soul without a body in this tragic intermediate state, but that's not God's ideal design there. It's a tragic distortion of it, Hannah. So then with this argument... No, no. Uh, angelic beings are spiritual without a physical component. Okay. Okay. They can't swim like you do. Isn't right. that sad? Because it seems like they're putting sin on flesh. And so if like supernatural things don't Right, they would say they're better. And I actually think that's part of what the writer of the Hebrews is combating with this angelic hierarchy of beings. And, and yeah, and so yeah, I, they would say an angelic spiritual state is, is better. And they would even call the body the prison house of the soul. I'm stuck in this prison. And, and so therefore the ideal is to get out of it, break out of the prison of the fleshly body, and then I'll be what I, I need to be. And that's not the Christian view. The Christian view is, no, this is how God made us, and this is how he's going to bring about the ultimate wonderful conclusion of his work in us through reuniting of the body and soul and resurrection. That's what gets resurrected and glorified. Just like in Jesus. Jesus' ministry is a prototype of God's ministry in us in this reuniting of body and soul and this affirmation of humanity right down to the physical existence. We gotta go, let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for creating us in your image, for your glory, body and soul. Lord, thank you that you have not minced words on the problem of sin and you haven't minimized the solution. Thank you for sending your son in the likeness of sinful flesh so that sinful flesh could be redeemed, so that our sin could be forgiven. Father, thank you for these wonderful truths. I, I pray they would be uh, appropriately transforming in our lives, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.